This is Journalism of Tomorrow, a three-part series that will look at how exciting advances in technology are helping to shape the news. I'll be talking to industry experts to find out how smartphones and even news in GIFs are changing the face of journalism. But first, let's take a look at how virtual reality is finding its place in the news. Virtual reality, or VR, is already being used across a wide range of industries, from gaming and cinema to medicine and the military. But what is it about VR that's getting so many people so excited? Different, different environment, it's yeah. a different space you, at you all. You could be anywhere at any time, really, so oh, that's... Yeah, I mean, you're literally in an entirely different world, yeah. and you can be on a different planet for all, all, all it matters. And uh, I mean, you can build it yourself. And you can build it. it. I, we you actually can have whatever you'd want in it, so you could make your perfect space. They can. The user can actually look around and actually get a feel of what's happening. So the point is to make the user see and make him feel uh, what it's really like to be there. I've come to BBC Research and Development to meet Zilla Watson, who's working to bring virtual reality and news together. You can use it to um, really put your viewer at the heart of a story so they can un be part of it and understand what's happening. This actually um, completely shifts that and puts your viewer in the um, privileged shoes of the reporter to see for themselves what it's like there and, and get much more of, of a sense themselves of what's going on. Virtual reality can be experienced in many ways depending on what equipment you can get your hands on. Though some VR devices are becoming affordable for consumers, you can kind of experience what it has to offer at the lowest level with just your smartphone, where the likes of YouTube and Facebook can use your phone's motion sensors to track movement and show you a full 360 degree view. Then there are the headsets which allow action to fill your peripheral vision and track your head movements to guide you around the scene. And here's when it can be really intense and immersive. Some headsets work with controls and motion sensors installed in a room, so you can put the goggles on and physically walk around and interact with the space around you. Just be careful not to fall over anything. Now, as well as being able to build the virtual environment with computer graphics, VR can also use 360 degree video. There are different ways in which filmmakers and journalists can do this, but is it practical? Telling a story in, in 360 is completely different from the way you construct um, a, a television news story. You haven't got close-ups, you haven't got cutaways. You've got to completely think, rethink how you, um, you frame your shot and, and get the camera in the right place to, to, to give a view that enables your um, audience to look around and see it for themselves. So, and you have to line up action, you have to do it carefully. And you, there are certainly some cuts where the camera's at a very different height that can be very disorienting for the viewer but um, it just it just involves creating a new grammar of filmmaking a new understanding and over time we'll learn what works and, and what doesn't so when we started um, filming a year ago we were using um, a standard GoPro rig which um, it's it, it, the post-production is laborious and that adds to the cost it, you can't turn it around really fast if you've got complex um, sequences to pull together because you you literally have to stitch together the footage from six or more cameras but more recently Recently, um, smaller consumer cameras have started to come on the, the market. We've been shooting with some of those in, in new situations because it means you can shoot and, and get it onto um, a website within half an hour. Work is in place to try and ensure that users get the most out of the virtual reality experience and don't risk missing out on key bits of action by looking the wrong way. Spatial sound is being developed and refined to help guide viewers to the right point on the 360 degree axis and something called haptic feedback will allow users to physically feel the impact of their actions, much like a vibrating games controller. But with the inevitable hike in production costs, can we be sure it's all worth it? And what kind of news stories will genuinely benefit from the virtual reality treatment? We haven't had um, significant audience testing. A lot of the um, virtual reality theory about 360 films and, and for journalism giving you presence and giving you a sense of being there at the heart of the action is, is unproven, it's anecdotal. It, 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 we need to actually prove that it really makes a difference to how people perceive and watch stories. 
I mean, the things I think work are, are stories where understanding the location and the, the scale of something um, really helps you make more sense of it. So once it becomes easy to scan environments and squares where big actions and things are happening, the, you know, the sort of possibility, again, of, of, of creating spaces that really help you understand where things have taken place or crawl through a space like the Hatton Garden Robbery Tunnel, those sorts of things will all become um, much easier to do and um, for people to see for themselves. Virtual reality is good, but it can only do so much. But I'd say that these things are like in its infancy. There's a lot, um, especially with the performance, uh, the device uh, capabilities. I'm actually really waiting for the day when they get rid of these headsets and all you have is just like contact lenses. You just put them in your eyes and you just like, you don't even have to move your head, then you move your eyes and you can like move around. That's my, that's my dream, like hopefully that happens. Oh, I'd say I'm You're excited. definitely excited. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I work for a research and development department and what we believe in is is testing things so we try it we see if it works we prototype we, pr we, we, we iterate we make it better and we test with audiences to see um, and and there just isn't a way around that there's lots and lots there's always lots of new innovation to try out and see um, and um, I'm obviously excited about virtual reality because um, of its potential audience engagement. I, I've seen how um, in, intense and immersive it, it can be and I want to um, explore how we can make that um, more universal and enable more people to try and, and experience what I've, I've seen. The most intense and amazing virtual reality um, experiences that um, I've had, for example, at, at Stanford's Virtual Reality Lab just make me want to um, explore and um, find ways to, to bring that sort of level of intensity to um, more people and to, to use it as a way to tell stories um, and for people to understand the world and to be able to step into places they would never otherwise be able to visit or understand um, through this new technology and, and that's what fascinates me about it. The speedy evolution of technology can sometimes be hard to keep up with, but something nearly all of us have access to is helping to shape the future of reporting. I've been speaking to a freelance video journalist and a broadcast technology expert to find out how the journalists of today can make the most out of the humble smartphone. First of all, you can have a smartphone in your pocket so you can always have a camera with you and not worry about anything. And the second thing is uh, you have the ability with a smartphone to, uh, so long as you have a signal, uh, to send your pictures back from wherever you are. When there's an, uh, a, an event, an incident, uh, flooding or snow or whatever, um, generally speaking, it's the ordinary people, if I can put it that way, who, with their phones who will be filming things. And we increasingly we rely on people to provide uh, those sort of pictures for us. So that's one big benefit. There are over 2 billion smartphone users in the world today. By next year, it's estimated there'll be 45 million people with a smartphone in the UK alone. That's a staggering 70% of the population. No wonder it's becoming increasingly easy to depend on user-generated content. But as a journalist, is the smartphone really the best tool for video reporting? The battery runs out quickly, signal can't always be relied on, and streaming video drains data. But this small device might just solve that problem. One thing we, we looked to do was create this, which is the, the live view smart grip. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically this is a grip that allows you to mount a phone to give you a more solid way to hold and to do okay. uh, stand-ups, to do interviews. It also mounts onto a tripod, so you can mount that and uh, give it a mounting point. Okay. It has a battery inside, so basically you plug this in and it extends the battery life of your phone, but it also has the MiFi inside. You're right, okay. Okay, so that gives you the second cellular connection. Yeah. So it, it's basically an accessory for the Lively Smart application that kind of brings those three accessories together into one pack. And the idea is that, you know, brought, um, Journalists that are using their smartphones day-to-day -day as a, a news-gathering tool 
can have these devices with them to kind of give them all of those accessories in one place. As it stands, this smart grip doesn't guarantee compatibility across all Android devices. So it's not the all-encompassing answer to using your mobile as a news gathering tool. But if your phone is one of the models that is supported by the smart grip, you have the advantage of its inbuilt bonding technology, which uses two or more mobile networks to reliably send footage back to the new studio. So when we talk about bonding technology, it's about basically taking the video traffic, the load that you want to send, and balancing it, distributing it across these different interfaces. So you're sending the traffic across each one. Yeah. Okay. And then at the receiving end, you're basically putting it back together. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we talk about bonding or aggregation, but it's basically using the connections. It's not picking the best one. It's using the traffic on all of those networks yeah. to give you more reliability. Sounds impressive, but smartphones can't always be depended on as a quality broadcast tool. Here's why. When you come to the smartphones, obviously you have the camera that's in the phone, so you know that's not part of our solution, but it's a, it's a limitation um, in terms of the technology. Obviously using the processor on the phone and using the modem on the phone, so you're limited by the hardware that's there, that's not part of our control. And the benefit of phones is that they're everywhere, so if you can find somebody nearby with a phone, you can get that live piece straight away, particularly in news where you know the, the time, the immediacy of getting the piece in is, is sometimes almost more important than, than the production values. You know, being able to use this device that's out there already uh, is, is very powerful. It's not just smartphones that are shaping the way we create and consume the news. I've come to the Isle of Wight where the two main news providers, the Counter Press and Isle of Wight Radio, are faced with a competition from a duo who are really making waves on the island. My name is Simon Perry and with my wife Sally we run a news publication called On the White and so when we came along and started doing this thing, it's called Vent the Blog originally, um, we were able to bring news out a lot faster than they were because their concentration was the newspaper. They had no competition really on the web. The, the radio was doing web stuff, but their focus was the broadcast. Makes total sense, you know, that's, that's what their backgrounds were, that's what their main focus was, that's what generated their money. We were, I think 2008, we started doing live reporting from council meetings. So it took a while, but they're now up to speed. And we're told, because uh, when we're not there we, we can't tell, but when um, there's a council meeting and we're not there covering it live, the uh, county press doesn't bother to tweet it live either. So, <laughs> With Dr Tony Hurst, a computing and communication specialist, Simon developed Automated News, a way of creating and publishing simple news stories through clever computer programming. The Automated News was us playing around and we sort of got together and said, well, you know, there's a potential of doing something interesting here. Um, and so, so through a series of experiments, we ended up deciding to make things simple as possible from the start. For automation to work successfully, you need to have a data feed, so some numbers coming from somewhere. They have to be in a structure that you understand in advance of them coming to you, because you need to be able to pick them out to place them into the article. You think about it when you're writing the article, it's just the same approach, but you code it into a program, mm -hmm. rather than sitting there and just writing it fresh each time. The question is, have these efforts been worth it? It's absolutely ridiculous amount of time we've spent on it for something that produces one article a month that doesn't take much longer than half an hour to write anyway. So why do it? Playing. Okay. Keeping, keeping busy. Um, trying stuff out. There's more that can come from this. It's a way of freeing journalists to do investigative work. Mm -hmm. Proper journalism that doesn't, you know, no one likes sitting down and writing the JSA report because it's utterly boring. So through automation, you can have those things taken from the journalist, but not replacing the journalist, just freeing that journalist up to do proper work. Mm. On the White Peaks, at an average of 100,000 unique visitors every month, with hundreds of thousands of user-generated comments over the publication's lifetime. So what is it about the hyperlocal news site that makes the locals want to engage so much? As to why people are engaging on, on the white more than other platforms, I don't know. 
I don't know. It's it's a really interesting question. You intrigued to know? I I should know. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, it could be. I'm going to put a few hypotheses forward That's because I don't know for sure. Um, for over ten years, we have been an open platform. We've not been a judgmental platform, and we've been a lightly um, managed comment section. So that has given people perhaps the confidence or the trust in us to not be selective about the comments that appear. We're strong believers in transparency um, and integrity in, in journalism. I, you know, we hope that most, most if not all journalists feel that way as well. Um, but we thought it's important for people to have a voice. And that was something that didn't seem to be available to people of the Isle of Wight at that point. Um, we had a discussion forum that was this sort of crazy place that lots of stuff went on, huge numbers of posts. Posts just on the stories alone, we've had over 130,000 comments. So it's shown that people did want to have a voice. And even in the days of social media that we're living in or enduring at the moment, I'm not sure, um, we still get lots of comments on there. And what's flattering about it is that publications from across the water are saying to us that, um, that there's some jealousy of the quality of comments that we have. So it would seem that On the White's success has roots in respect for the reader and an agenda focused on giving local people a voice. It's clear that the popularity of publications could certainly increase with this kind of approach. And though journalism is undergoing a continuous evolution, it doesn't necessarily point to the disappearance of traditional news sources. When people think things are suddenly changing, things are suddenly go, going to disappear, that's not necessarily the case. Things tend to be gradual. Print journalism, newspapers, the demise of newspapers <clears throat> was predicted years and years ago, and they have gone down, there's no question. Circulations have gone down, and unfortunately a lot of local newspapers have closed for a variety of uh, reasons actually, but they're still there. Print journalism still exists. So I don't think you have to have uh, one disappear to allow for another. I think we're, we're getting a multiplicity of, of things now, and I think that's actually quite a good thing actually, and I think we would see that continue. Yeah, I, the idea of predicting the future of all these things, having run a publication that was about the digitization of media, all you can do is say what people, are, what's becoming available. Making predictions of whether something will be successful or not is a fool's game. picture when you think of someone who likes to watch or read the news? Perhaps an older and more serious person? A troubling dilemma for many news providers is how to engage with the younger audience. Are kids just not interested in the news? Apparently not, according to Channel 4. I met with Stacey Bird and Jack Croft, the team behind 4 Newswall, to find out how news in gifts has helped to unlock this somewhat impenetrable generation. We got briefed on it just to come up with something that would replace sort of you know, general sort of 60 second video and stuff like that, that would be a bit innovative for them to try and get youth looking at the news. It's a file format that hasn't been used to communicate the news before, so we thought, yeah, and I mean, it was, it was an initial thing of like, we do the news in GIFs, that is it. Yeah. But it was after that initial thought, it was quite a long process of figuring out how best to do that, because I mean, if you looked at the earlier versions that we did, it was yeah, really awful. bad. So <laughs> yeah, it really awful. It took a while to... Yeah, it did take a while yeah, to refine what news and gifts kind of was going to be. And I guess it is, a, it is a bit of a sort of lame thing to say, yeah, kids love gifts, so we're just going to do this in gifts. Like it, it, it want, we wanted it to be beyond that. We didn't want it to just be like, oh yeah, kids like this, so let's just do it like that. But I guess the initial thought did come from gifts are funny, gifts are cool, gifts yeah, are quick. and the quick, the speed, like yeah. the, the challenge that you've got to try and communicate headline or a story or a feeling of something in, you know, how many seconds. 
So how was this idea of going beyond the GIF achieved? When you go into the website and you click on the GIFs, you do, we do then, we then had bespoke written news. So it was beyond just, we then had the news as, in as sort of a tight a little um, paragraph as possible, something that can get you the kind of general generalisation of the story. And then obviously it pushed through into Channel 4 News uh, website and also into like a wider conversation on Twitter or if there was articles that were relevant or films that were relevant, it then pushed through into that. It kind of didn't matter whether they just looked at a few GIFs or they read further into the story. I guess it's up to the user to... Yeah, as long as they were kind of somehow involved in themselves in the news, that, yeah. was, that was our aim really. But if it didn't matter how far they read into his story, how could we be sure that the content is being taken in by the desired audience? Surely youngsters can just avoid the nitty gritty of the story and just stick around for the entertainment of the GIF. The benefit of having the layers of news is that people can become as involved in the story as they choose to be. Whether they read the GIF and that's, that's as much as far as they go and then they sort of, oh yeah, you know, that's, that happened, that's fine. But if we offer a little bit more and then a little bit more, it, people can go as far down the track as they want, they can read into the story as much as they want and they can learn as much as they want and become part of a wider conversation. But if we just offer the GIF and that's it, it's kind of, it is a little bit, it feels a bit blunt, doesn't it? It feels blunt you to not to offer more. Well. Yeah, it's it just like kind there's of, nothing else to say yeah. about the subject matter that's been... And there's always more to say with the news. It's never straightforward, yeah. you know. These stories are never, ever as straightforward as you read. I mean, you could go from one newspaper and read one story that is complete, read completely different in a different newspaper. We all know that there's, like, you know, many sides, many facets to every story. So I guess we just wanted to offer the ability to look at a little bit beyond just the headline, but still keep that quite lightweight and still accessible for a younger audience. It's not just the platform and the method of delivery that need to be taken into account in order to engage 16 to 25s in the news. The choice of stories also requires careful selection. So what works and what doesn't? I feel like ones that did really well were space ones. NASA found this or that robot that lives on the moon or whatever it does did this and um, and so then we would sort of slightly tailor those stories to it but we would tr still try and cover the bigger stories as well and there was one with about which maybe says something about the story more than the gif but was about um kim kardashian having a baby and it was sort of like a baby spinning on a and the um, <laughs> the one with um, on a compass there was one for, through the whole fifa thing that happened oh the balls the that golden one balls. did really well that yeah. got like i think it was like seth blatter wasn't it sat in prison with like surrounded it was like seth blatter sat in prison surrounded by loads of balls wasn't it yeah yeah that did quite well I think the main thing is it's got to be shareable and that is like that does come down to design as well as content mm. so yeah I guess the Seth Blatter one was fu was funny but it was also a really relevant story to that age group hmm sounds like some real hard news there but perhaps there's something we can learn from this is it that kids just aren't interested in serious stories I don't think so for four news wall it seems that the funnier the gif the more successful the story is even when it comes to stereotypically dull news about politics, for instance. Take one example. They superimposed George Osborne's face onto an acorn-munching squirrel for the autumn statement. And there's even one with Jeremy Corbyn and David Cameron in the middle of an arm wrestle for Prime Minister's questions. It's clear that the way in which the gifts are designed could potentially engage the youth in stories that they would otherwise dismiss from another news source. I really like the GIFs and stuff and the animation, so I think it makes you kind of like want to look at the news more. Do you find it funny? Yeah, it's quite funny. I mean, there's, a, there's one here of, um, what's his name, Donald Trump, which is quite funny actually. It's like a little GIF of him, just his mouth opening up and down like that, <laughs> which is quite great. <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty sweet. I'd use it personally. It invites me to look at the subject of the news, but I don't know if it's an interesting article or not, but it makes me want to look at it, yeah, so. The GIFs went beyond the website and onto our TV screens in the form of snappy 20-second bulletins. These were scheduled to line up with Channel 4's Hollyoaks to ensure the right audience was watching. But with the likes of on-demand TV, surely audiences can choose how, when and what to watch. Can we truly target any more? I mean, it's a tough question that even we, you know, we had challenges with, with 4 News World. 
Um, I mean, effectively, you can with prom with paid promotions. You can put things in front of people's news feeds. Just make but them care about but it. Exactly. Yeah. That's the problem with it. Is like, how do you get people to actually care about it? Facebook is just like a wash with people's opinions of this and that and that and all of that. And I think that is makes it really hard to get a, get get a proper story across and get a proper angle across and stuff like that for, for journalism specifically. I don't know, man. It's really tricky, isn't it? Young people, a lot of people think they're sort of like they don't really care, but I, I do think they do. I think they just need to find a portal that is actually interesting for them and, and, under, and relatable and understandable. Four News will maybe somewhat successful in getting perhaps the gist of current stories across, but is it really news? On one hand, it could be innovative, but on the other, could it be idiotic? Yeah, because there was the, um, is it Gu Guida? Gu Gu Guido is a... Anyway, he did quite a scathing like thing, which said it's, this isn't journalism, this is idiocy or something like that. Because if you don't provoke any sort of negative reactions as well as positive, then you, the likelihood is that it's, it's not different enough and it's not interesting enough. So I think there's always going to be, I mean, we've had it on other projects that we've worked on where you just get so much crap from people. Yeah. You know. When somebody says, oh, I think it's idiotic, I think you can read into that and think, well, actually, it's probably because your news source to the people that we're aiming it at, probably see it as your news source is boring. Yeah. So it's actually just a more interesting way of looking at the news yeah. and a quicker way of looking at the news. Yeah, yeah I, I like the fact that there's people who say yeah. bad things as well. I do. Just eight months and a thousand gifts later, Four News Wall was no more. The reasons for its closure are ambiguous, but there are some vital points that we can take away when it comes to engaging young people in the news. I enjoyed News Wall because, um, it was a piece of innovation that was fun to make, and um, although very difficult at times. So I particularly like the use of um, imagery uh, in combination with a news story. Mm. You look at all of the big news companies, all the newspapers, all the TV news companies, they're all pretty much using like Getty and Reuters for their pictures. Yeah. They're all using Even the same did. sort of photographers. But what we did was we used those same ones but reformatted them in yeah. a different way, added a bit of movement, merged lots of pictures together and it's just something more in the way that the words work with the images and just gives you a little bit more to add to the, the story that's happening there because I think that's why the news can just be so flat to some people it's just there's no other level to it it's just mm -hmm. here's a fact about something that happened whereas if you've got here's a fact about something that happened and here's a very slight little bit of commentary on what happened in a funny little image or a clever little image it just gives you something else I guess it's like in a really weird, rudimental kind of way, you are advertising that story, and like maybe yeah. you kind of should see it as a little bit more of an advertising brief. And you're like, right, I need to get people in to read this story. I need to assume now that people aren't interested, which is a horrible way, cause, and that's not true of everybody. But I think it's a good way to to think about how you use your images. Like, I need to get people mm -hmm. involved in this story, and I guess in a much cruder way, that's what. News World was doing, it was like using imagery, using headlines in a different way to get people in to read the story. It would seem then that this kind of atomised content, where the news is broken up into quick snackable chunks, is the way to growing young people's interest in the news. By offering audiences the control to explore particular stories as much as they choose to, news providers can buck the trend that we see in the likes of Flipboard and Netflix, where the power of selection and choice has shifted into the hands of the users. And perhaps, looking forward, this may be the only way that the news can stay relevant to the next generation. I really enjoyed Four News Wall, actually. It's really kind of colourful and bright. And, um, and there's faces you recognise and things that you, you think, oh, OK, yeah, I've kind of heard that story, but this is a new way of looking at it. And I, th I thought it was quite easy, fairly easy to use, so, yeah, definitely. I'll definitely use it again. Yeah.